Hello, everyone. As you're joining here, welcome. Welcome to Zoom. This is the Brooklyn Rails 822nd New Social Environment. It's our 137th poetry reading. Um, and today we are so excited to have Nicole Perafit, who has curated a flock of poets reading avian works. And Nicole is joined by Pierre Joris, Marcella Durand, Latasha Diggs, and E.J. McAdams. Um, and we are just so thrilled to have you all here. I'm going to get out of the way. Um, please pay attention to the chat. We will be linking to books and various endeavors of the different poets. And thank you all so much for joining today. I'll turn it over to you, Nicole. Hello, hello, everybody. OK, let me share screen. Okay, here we go. Are we on? Okay, keep <laughs> doing it again. We should not have the, got out of it. <laughs> no, it's not, doesn't want to do the share screen. Ah, are we on? No. No, it's saying it doesn't want to do it again. It just this when we redo it, it, um, it gets cranky. Uh, yeah. no problem. Do you want to, we could um, turn it to Marcella and then we can. Uh, I'd like to, I'd like to try to, because I was going to present every, um, every poet was going to have a bird. And um, I would have liked them to have their bird before they start. Giving us the bird, eh? <laughs> well, no rush. Yeah. Can... Are we there? No. Do you see it? No? no. Okay, well then, um, last time. Nicole, feel free to act that. There you go. Here we are. There you are. We're there. We have it? Yes. yes. Fabulous. Finally. Lay. Ah, voila. Thank you, Brooklyn Rail. Well, thank you, Ansem, who's not here, but is um, recovering and Carolyn and um, uh, Chloe and everyone involved behind the scenes. And I'm delighted to curate the 137th Wednesday poetry reading with our amazing flock of poets. Marcella Duran, Latasha Diggs, Pierre Joris and E.J. McAdams. Thank you all for tuning in. And remember, you can donate to the Brooklyn Rail. There is a donate, bu donate button. Uh, and they have events every day. Alors, I'm going to introduce each poet but mostly the bird they choose to be accompanied with today. I'm going to do them all at once. The traditional bios are in the rail web on the rail website and they're going to be on the chat. All the photos and the film that I will present are mine. And the sounds sometimes are from the Macaulay Library or eBird. Voila. Well, May, let's begin. So our first reader will be Marcella. And I'm quoting Marcella Duran here, who says. My main avian love is the wood thrush and its beautiful song to which I may only aspire. Marcella has led bird poetry walks in Corlier's Hawk Park and Naval Cemetery Landscape. And I hope her companion bird Rupert will pay us a visit and maybe we'll perform my favorite Earth, Wind and Fire song, this disco song, September. I really, I really hope that will happen, but we'll see about that later. Our next um, bird poet is EJ, and EJ says, in the aughts, while Mary Taylor Moore and I were fighting a fancy building on Fifth Avenue to bring back the nest, of celebrity or hawks, pale male and Lola, I had a dream once that I was a red tail hawk circling in big gyres over Central Park, only to dive out of the sky and transform back into human form as I walked out of the farmer's gate at 110th and Lennox. About a year later, I moved to Harlem and for a long time, like a fanboy, I probably over identify with red tail hawks. But that changed. But now I am older. 
I identify with vultures and any creature trying to digest death, which seems, which seems like too big of a meal. So he's currently part of an extensive community project organized by Janine Bardo at Stanford Gallery in Bay Ridge called Bay Ridge Through an Ecological Lens, curated by Jennifer McGregor. And he has a piece with his buddy, um, um, uh, Jimbo, and it was in collaboration with Eco Art Space. Some of us participated on some of his incredible uh, poetry artwork. So uh, maybe we can put that in the chat, EJ. You can put the link for that uh, event in Bay Ridge. Um, then we have Pierre Joris and his brother bird, the cormorant. And this is what he says. The cormorant is my brother bird, literal translation of their Japanese name, a kanji name. Not only because I am a library cormorant, but because the beauty of their straight, fast, silent flight just above the waters on my daily walk along the narrows never stops fascinating me. The poems my brother birds have given me are gathered in the book of you, illustrated by Nicole's drawing and painting, and we will see some of these later. So here is, oh, Jesus, I forgot to put the little film of my very, my very favorite place, Coney Island Creek. This is in between uh, Culverville and Coney Island Creek and our dear double-crested cormorants. Now, Latasha. Latasha chose the red-winged blackbird. She didn't tell me why, but I too love them. And they are a powerful symbol of joy. And their bold, brassy, piercing songs definitely gets your attention. And it's an easy one to identify. The name Agelaeus is derived from ancient Greek Agelaios, meaning gregarious. And that fits Latasha so well because being with Latasha or just thinking about Latasha is always a good time. Mm -hmm. And the red winged blackbird are good omen and vital animal, um, vital animal totem to many, many American tribes. So here we go. And we notice that the female and the male are actually quite different. So now my bird, I fell in love with the American Dipper in Montana. They are true pluridisciplinary artists of life to which I may only aspire, as Marcella said earlier. They are the only truly aquatic song birds. So they sing, they swim above and below the water, they fish underwater, they build nests on almost vertical surfaces and Often over rush, often often rushing waters, over rushing waters, or behind waterfalls. And they are doing this constant little dance in tune with the stream. And last but not least, they have this irresistible white feathers on their eyelids, a makeup I have been doing before I met them. So we truly are kindred spirits. So that was the presentation of our poets. I don't know if, I hope they don't have complaints or about what happened with their birds. And now, so I'm gonna read my portion of my, my I'm gonna read my poems. So I'm gonna start with the herons. And uh, this is in one of my notebooks. And now here we are. Ardeas Erodias, August 8, 2022. High tide, high tide day between Calvervoe and Coney Island Creek. I paddle among five impassable great blue herons perched on shipwrecks and rusted industrial decay. This majestic Pony Island sentinels remain silent, vigilant, resilient, and they will wait patiently for their prey to come within range. 
neither the muffled brouhaha of cars, planes, and soccer games nearby, nor the gouged out eye of the almost fully submerged yellow submarine seem to be of concern. My presence is noticed, but not significant. One takes off. Its majestic flight leaves me elated, deflated. The gracious landing on the gnarled dead tree is seem poetic. And the message is clear, is potent and clear. Find peace and time by yourself. Which means, which means, which means, Puskatees, which means, Puskatees. Life, world, thoughts, granted by Kildare proximity phenomenon, Charadrius Bosiphorus. Shift my mind from in the world to in their world, both swamped by cold winter sun and industrial remains still at Calvergoe. This is just a fact. A situation to be observed and delight in, a golden moment to spread my wings beyond my limited content. Ksuksuhis, ksuksuhis. Razor Bill. The colonial seabird seems to be alone today. I am literally chasing Le Petit Penguin up and down the narrows and barely keeping up with my bicycle. I'm counting how long they stay underwater to be able to catch a shot between dives. It's cold, it's crisp, it's bright. We both love it. We both having grand fun. Our playful disposition doesn't reveal any concerns regarding our status. The colonial, they as the only extant member of the genius family Alcidae and I as an homo sapien, a roughly 20 million years younger species. These moments hold neither despair nor hope, but a sense of co-presence, an awe-filled moment with a companion species. Purple sandpipers. The Calidris maritima are foraging on shore promenades, very slippery rocks. Our Olartic winter residents have returned from their Arctic tundra breeding grounds. Les becas au violet, s'il vous plaît, are bicontinental. Yes, purple sandpipers. They can be found on both shores of the Atlantic, from Greenland in Iceland to northern Spain and exceptionally in North Africa. In my birth country, France, they winter along the coast from Dunkirk to Biarritz. And on our American coast, their wintering extend to Maryland. How smart of them to avoid all the tourist traffic. And to finish, uh, these are from my Leporello. Connection um, connection en mille feuilles, available from Red Spot Press or from me. Mille feuilles connection. A poet dared to ask the sun to rise. A tree is not just a tree, and the older the tree gets, the more complex. H two O made us me. I play a minor role in the bird's world. In December 2021, a mega rarity for our region appeared at Alzed Park, a displaced ash-throated flycatcher. The Miarchus cinearens had wandered from the western skies and graced us with his presence for several weeks. 
are we at the right place at the right time? Being for the world, être pour le monde, no, that's too Christian and too transcendent. Being in the world, être au monde, that's already better. But being of the world, être du monde, best, because it's a sense of imminence. We polish an animal mirror to look for ourselves. Donna Haraway. At Jones Beach, a few weeks later, meeting with Horned Lark on a glorious freezing January day, January day, my favorite birding weather. No, I will certainly not pluck the lark as the French song instructed. Alouette, gentille alouette, alouette, je ne te plumerai pas. Alouette, gentille alouette, alouette, je ne te plumerai pas. Thank you. <laughs> Stop sharing. Here we I go. Just... <laughs> Thank you, Nicole. That was so meltingly relaxing. I feel like my whole yeah, body is just <laughs> <laughs> entered another realm. And I love the term co-presence. Um, Thank you. And it, I, it's so interesting to me how your circle of birds is so different from mine, although you're just a few miles in a different, slightly different micro environment. That's, that's amazing. I have not even seen so many of the birds that you've seen in New York City. So, um, okay, so I'm going to share my screen. So um, these are sort of collaborative, sometimes slightly interpretive, although I'm playing around with seeing how much I want to do that, um, mirror responses to bird recordings that I've been doing over the last year. Um, this is all quite new, and I'll, I'll start with a straight on recording of a hermit thrush just to set the scene. Hermit thrush. Rain falls straightly in lines, but glances off leaves, and the regularity of these diversions quiets the line, and not here in the graph are the scents of water plus leaves. Your migrating song and expansive sense of distances make for forward glow against rain's soft brush marks, lines like perfect small asteroids. Location unknown, we were deep wherever we were. We were the silent ones receding into background of gray as you sang to another, not us. And we tried to hear not us, but you. Eastern Peewee. I would have thought you a thin wire of air and you are against the cross hatch of Katie Dids, but you are also hard staples. Messy X, thick lines with trailing ends stomping through the woods. Your transcription of sound can be so like and unlike your name, your otherwise whistling, questioning, onomatopoetic name. Dark-eyed junko. Thick lines, zips that are steps and pile driving, walking in construction, walking through construction, clattering, and against the zips, a dog barks, its lower register a pile of what looks like dog shit at the bottom of the graph. Against that somewhere is your song that appears as two lines, lightning flares, just enough to identify. Red-bellied woodpecker. Against monotonous growl of vertical lines and lower dark smudge of background traffic, three fragmenting marks with small flick to the right, a built bit of a lilt against all our verticality. 
12 seconds to record before you flew off elsewhere to land full body against the next tree. American Pippet. Five minutes long and people talking, someone forgot to turn off the recording and amid the white-throated sparrows, house sparrows, European starlings, robins, an American Pippet. Which dot represented you? Were you the bird that looked slightly like a sparrow, a bit larger, a bit more striped, or so I thought, chatting with a neighbor on the bench and eyeing you idly? All these dark lines of human voice and of species who survived so close to us somewhere was maybe you. And I think those two lines, faint lines, are the pivot. I'm not sure. Ring billed gull, lesser black backed gull. The cries of the ring billed gull are pathetic fallacy. They look like trees with branches spinning out, they look like how they fly groups of wings seemingly disorganized, so responsive to wind and water with a million decisions encoded in landing and takeoff, the ever-changing ways gulls lift off water. Then, a ribcage-shaped sound amid the fractals, a human child's voice, skeletal shape of mirrored resonance, yet spine of emptiness in between. How quickly does that space vanish as soon as we are seen by others? Cooper's hawk and downy woodpecker and Cooper's hawk. We're whispering because then the recording won't hear us and a plane goes by. Its drone looks like it sounds a boring up and down line with no variance. And then lines of sediment drying after a flood, a piece of jasper, trickery of stripes along tail feathers. We look up to find you and you call to another at a different tree. Another, larger, higher, calling back. The downy woodpecker works away in between you. Yellow-throated warbler. Almost a figure, almost running, heard across expanse of artificial turf and running to hear you better still at top of tree over highway and people playing ball and myself alone, only one, seeing your yellow throat and inky stripes at top of tree, only one, in the entire city, almost a figure, faintly. I run to hear you across graph to prove you were there the day before the tree you sang on was cut down the very day before you were there. House Sparrow. Your calls are chromosomal, as unfamiliar in their trailing X shapes as they are familiar to the ear. Within what seems a monotonous chirp, is variations of tone, shadows quivering at each side, rising from the persistent gray smudge of background city noise to dissolve into what looks like arms, what looks like the roots of teeth on x-rays, what looks like little figures with hands raised and no heads off the edges of the graph into whatever you are singing with each other so urgently about. Scarlet tanager and cockatiel. Marks as vivid as your body, black wings about scarlet oval or gray body with orange circles on your cheeks and yellow face. Zigzag, peak, valley, plateau, check marks, stock market crash, high and low. And the other bird whose calls are dashes that appear in ladder escalation about your Vs. Domestic versus wild versus V, beings from different hemispheres do not correlate, are on completely different levels of communication, of sound, of cagery, caginess, cotness. Wood thrush. Haunted, haunting, ghostly, exact, echoing, crystalline, invisible in woods, solely sonic presence, conjuring distance from treetop to sky, root to crown, the sense of echoing space, Again, your shape is not unlike the bird you are, a sense of precise spatial recognition and movement, geometry and sound and flight. And just ahead of that angled shape is the song moving in front of it in unsure form of knowing.
Thank you. Oh, wow. That was beautiful, Marcella. I love the use of the sound waves. In <laughs> it's so amazing, the ghosting. Well, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Amazing. Nicole. All right. Suivant. Thank you, Marcella. That was awesome. Um, I just keep thinking of like, uh, if we're the bird poets, then uh, that was a chance to see the poet birds in those that, you know, inscription, uh, that image of their voice. It was wonderful and uh, won't think of a house sparrow the same after that one. Um, Thank you, Nicole, for including me in this flock of poets and for the Brooklyn Rail hosting us. This is amazing. Um, I'm, I, I have a book coming out this year in September. It's called Last. Uh, I'm going to read the, the poem that the title's after. It's about the last passenger pigeon um, who was named Martha uh, and uh, lived at the Cincinnati Zoo. Uh, for those of you who don't know, passenger pigeons um, used to have short migratory flocks uh, that would block out the sun for days. So that was the abundance of that bird. Um, and the last one uh, died in the zoo September 1st, 1914. This is um, actually just using language only from the um, obituary. Last one. Death is the last of the last, standing wild in North America from the time through when she first pecked the shell, death nursed her carefully. A zone remains the size of black wings too. There has to be found the extinct way within loss so that together feathers will be preserved of queenly young delight and love iridescent. Um, so as you may be getting a sense from all these uh, readings, uh, New York City's incredible uh, bird place. Um, there's many birds that come through New York City, but also live in New York City and breed. And there's herons and cormorants uh, and uh, egrets that nest on the islands around uh, New York City that New York City Audubon monitors and has been since the early 80s. Um, there's been declines and the scientists have been trying to figure out what those declines are. This is a little poem called The Decline of Herons in the Arthur Kill. The Arthur Kill is that body of water between Staten Island and New Jersey. Rain beats earth in unmeasurable rhythm, scouring rocks, kissing leaves, the green pastures, sucked into the soil by tentacles of roots to synthesize food. Rain not constant as the stars, bearing pastures, pesticides, and fertilizers like shimmering chemical tankers. To the stream, river, harbor, fish breathe rain in aggregate, the sustaining rain now slightly sublethal, the fish then sublethal, the sublethal fish then fed to great white egret chicks who now slightly more lethargic sleep a little more among nest parasites whose tiny bites lesion the epidermis of emergent feather shafts ever so slightly enough. Before sowing, one must cut. Curious as a cat about this goldfinch on a sycamore branch, dazzle of neon yellow against matte green leaves. I can almost fall for the way in flight it knits the present moment, a unity of ah. Until potential climate futures seep through the stitching, boiling black ooze of ruins, 
human cries like singing birds twisted necks entangled in the knot of this world where injustice is distributed unequally by gun muzzles. It's a nightmare out there. The blind mycelium remind me through a nerve polyphony at my toes. No one knows, no one knows, no one knows the future. So you have to choose. No one knows, no one knows, you have to choose. Many uh, know Jack Collum, uh, the poet, he was also an uh, incredible birder. Um, and when he passed, uh, a bunch of poets, including some on this Zoom, uh, got together to celebrate him by going birding. This is the list of all the birds that we saw, as well as a little poem interwoven. Jack Collum Memorial Reading Birdless Poem. One, European Starling. I remember wondering what reading the poet's words collectively could do. Two, House Sparrow. Reading Jack's poems. Three, Common Grackle. The poets bearing the poet in them. Four, Pigeon. Bird, song, poem. Five, American Robin. Bird sung. Jack's poem, not much difference. Six, House Finch. Setting sun shown on morning poets, no F-A-R-T acrostics. Seven, Northern Cardinal. Feel searing phonemes in your larynx, whoa. Eight, American Red Start. Exchanges change the exchangers, the exchange, the medium. Nine, yellow crowned night heron. Jack making poems by other means. 10, northern water thrush. Nature's long experience of sustain. We have a lot to learn. 11, song sparrow. Inefficiency, redundancy, diversity. Good tools for human uncertainty. 12, northern flicker. Self correcting feedback. 13, Palm Warbler, poets reading the dead poet's poems. 14, Blue Gray Gnat Catcher, the poet in death becomes poets. 15, Ruby Crown Kinglet, Warbler, Dusk, Chorus. So those are a lot of bird poems. Uh, this is a poem that has a little bit of birds in it. It's called Happy Earth Day. It's actually for Marcella and Karen. Uh, we wrote happy Earth Day poems to each other. This is an acrostic. Hundreds of sanderlings in the nutrient mix at rack line, among an infinite, invisible to the human eye, number of electrons. Pain is not optional, but do we have to dish it out as policy? Please put your arms down and bear peace as your weapon. You are not you for very long, shipwrecked on this rock, earth, and with dogs who knows themselves under your arms for a hug. Rounded up and imprisoned during World War II, Japanese farmers then never went back to their fertile land, the trail sign says. Can't be the whole story. Hope despairs, despair hopes. A wimbrel whimpers or wimps and flies off. Yes is a full sentence. So this is the last poem. Um, you know, everybody has a larynx. They know how to make sound from their voice box. Um, as you saw in some of those incredible um, uh, images of bird song, birds have a syrinx. That's where they make their sound. It's a little rain raindrop size bony perturbance. Um, that's right at the intersection of their bronchi and the trachea. And they can do multiple songs at once. They can basically duet with themselves. Like that's how you get the staple shape. Um, and, you know, it's like a duet within their own body, um, like a motet, a hocket. Like the, it's just an unbelievable way of making sound. And it evolved out of the larynx. So I, I, I
I'm going to try as my final poem today to, to syrinx the larynx. <laughs> syrinx sh, the sh, larynx. No logos, no logos. Cloud scape, lands cape. Turning away from uniformity, t, t, control toward seeing, seeing song, call. Calling, call, poly, see, mick, 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 poly, vocal, all, Queen's English, here is Birdlish. Who are you? Are we, we, we? A wish, a wash, near ish, 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 noise, noise, making utopian. Inter reliance, enter reliance, relationality, t, t, if you do. Not ask for help, you are not kind. Scare city ain't the store. E abundance is respectful in ambiguity. T -t -t. What a beautiful syrinx nade, we got to call it. <laughs> wow, that was intense. Thank you. Now, a tough act to follow. Brother Corboran. Let me share something yeah. here. Okay, the first two are from a um, secret book called 60 Birds for Niku. Brown Thrasher. No, the Romans didn't know this bird as Toxostoma rufum. It got Christian with that name by some Christian, though Linnaeus in his 18th century work Systema Natura called it a Turdus rufus. And looking it up, I learned that the Genus name Toxostoma comes from ancient Greek toxon, bow or arch, and stoma, mouth. The specific rufum is Latin for red, but covers a much wider range of use than the English term. We'll just go on calling you a brown thrasher and won't poetically link that to thrush, as some have, because I learned it does not belong to the thrushes even if or when it hangs in the bushes. It's a numbers game, i.e. can two be a gaggle of geese? And can 19 pigeons be wrong? I mean, be anything else than a flock? Or else pick any of these, a bevy of quail, a bouquet of pheasants when flushed, a brood of hens, a building of rooks, a cast of hawks or falcons, a charm of finches, a colony of penguins, a company of parrots, a congregation of plovers, a cover of coots, a covey of partridges or grouse or marmigans, a deceit of lapwings, a descent of woodpeckers, a dissimulation of birds, a dole of doves, an exaltation of larks, a fall of woodcocks, a flight of swallows or doves, goshawks or cormorants, a gaggle of geese, 
wild or domesticated, a host of sparrows, a kettle of hawks riding a thermal, a murmuration of starlings, a murder of crows, a muster of storks, a nigh of pheasants on the ground, an ostentation of peacocks, a paddling of ducks on the water, a parliament of owls, a party of jays, a peep of chickens, a pitying of turtle doves, a raft of ducks, a raft of turkeys, a siege of herons, a skein of geese in flight, a sword of mallards, a spring of teal, a tiding of magpies, a trib of dotterel, an unkindness of ravens, a watch of nightingales, a wedge of swans, a wisp of snipe. And here we have you, the most widely distributed wild birds in the world are like us, European immigrants. Why then are you, my house sparrows, all around our house, but none in the house? Why do you pass a well-named passer, domesticus, that is domesticated passer, without ever coming into the house in your name? Now I'll read some from uh, the Book of Cormorants, which uh, is my most recent, which is contained in my most recent volume called Interglacial Narrows from Concha Mundum Press to 2023 and uses this painting by Nicole as cover. Here is the cover as such with gorgeous text on it. The book is now available. Do go out and buy it. The following images of Cormorants are of course also all paintings by Nicole. Two for the cormorants. One, the heart of the cormorant is at the head of its name. It wants more, but no rant. Two, we applaud the cormorant, even if the fish slipping down its skullet won't. And a poem called In the Absence of Cormorants. In the Absence of Cormorants, a cricket. Cicada? No, a female mantis. It is green, walks the narrow railing along the narrows. A turtle pokes its head out of the quiet water before diving to the bottom. Here things are upside down. The earth carries a turtle on his back, and the mantis looks down on it all, worried or unworried, th that it may fall. Halfway down my morning walk and a lament for missing fauna forms in my head, remembering yesterday's mantis and turtle with only a half dozen sleepy gulls swinging nonchalantly on the flat waters halfway between here and Staten Island. So this all an in-between, a halfway house New York. When of a sudden from under the water a comrade emerges sits quietly for a moment, and then with Olympic precision, as it starts to dive back under another cormorant breaks surface 25 feet away in perfect rhyme with its disappearing semblable. A fellow crocorax da fort, fort da. Make my morning, no doubt, theirs too. Two poems after Basho. It's from Basho that I first came across the Cormorant when in 66 in Paris, I bought the Blythe edition of Basho's haikus. I thought of that and went back to it. After Basho one, a bird a pleasure to see, though soon sadness. Boats, yes, but no Cormorant. Omo Shirote, Yagata kana shiki, ubune kana. In my homophonic translation, this becomes, oh mush, I wrote, vacate can as hickey, you bun a canner. After Basho two. Again, hitching my frock, that river again, yet missing vinegary sweetfish. Mataya Tagui, 
Magara no kawa no ayu namazu. Met aye a ted gui. Nayagara no kaven no. A you name as soon. And the <clears throat> final poem is called Guano Apoptosis. Before the ghost cargo appeared, you pointed worldlessly smiling, two fingers in V shaped I looked at, then thinking better a bit, I looked through them or their shape as if an aim taking device and saw one quick black thin streak that turned into two just above the water. You and me, you said, I'm the one up front, you added. Yes, I joke, you are, but I'll beat you to it at the post. Those were the two first cormorants of July. There would be one more higher up, two more going south, and then coming back, three sitting on the water and diving. One of them, the middle one, bringing up a good-sized fish and swallowing it, and us thinking, and you saying, wow, that was a big fish indeed. And I adding, look how he drinks water now to help wash it down. And you, as we walked on, wondered exactly how, and differently from other animal processes, the cormorants broke down those fish arrived unshoed and whole in their stomachs to produce that major guano, the Fala Crocoracidae familia is rightly famous for. And you surmised that maybe the fish lend a hand, I mean a fin, by somehow helping advance their own decomposition, which puzzled me a bit, but then I thought of Michel Serre's word apoptosis, the small death, elementary suicide of cell, organ, and organism, from the name the Greeks gave the fall of leaves in autumn, a fourth death, a word I gave you when we got home and which you are now working with in the context of our essay on the colonization of the island of Alcatraz, another confused bird matter, while I try here now just to get the facts of the morning walk down in these no longer so equal length lines in the hope that on rereading I can clarify them, as one says of butter, into yet another Cormoran celebration. Thank you. Thank you, Pierre. No, oh, I have to get out of here. How do yes. I do it? Hold on. Stop sharing. Yeah. And the exaltation of poets continues with Latasha. Where are you, Latasha? Yeah. Uh, ah, yeah, I'm, here. I'm here. Just had to unmute myself. And I also had a, a very uh, last minute um, mood of inspiration and a request. Um, thank you, Chloe. Um, and thank you, Nicole, for um, having me part of this. My relationship with birds is one of escape and uh, wish to have the type of freedom they have, the, the freedom of flight to, to bounce when it's necessary to bounce. Um, uh, I, I, I look at birds in the relationship of being someone who's from New York. Um, so, uh, being introduced to birds in in its in their ability and and their migration patterns has been in part to my my conversations with Marcella and EJ and um, they know me for my um, for my my one particular relationship with a bird um, in the park. Um, which is very different from other, <laughs> other relationships. And um, I just want to share very quickly, um, I want to first open up with a quote, um, the first verse from uh, a poem called Crow by the poet Meg Kearney. Um, 
and uh, it's a delightful book. And the book is, is just a, a, a book of poems about birds. And I think I'll open it up with this verse and then this image which tickled me because someone had just posted this in the chat room and I thought it was rather appropriate to um, uh, for, for this and I don't know why Let's try that again. Let's try this again. I do know how to do the share thing. Um, it's just being stupid right now. Um, okay, participants can now see you sharing. Okay, let's stop sharing. Um, advanced. Um, this is an interesting, okay, we're gonna have to do this. So, Now y'all know my business. <laughs> but um, the, the quote, the, the quick little quote was something in the chat room that basically said, so important to notice when the home of a bird disappears, which I think is wonderful for the work that I'm gonna read. Um, and now the quote from uh, Meg Crow, it was a crow First, it was a crow first taught me how to pry a thing open, snatch a stick to leverage a headstone or widen the hole of a rotten pine's trunk to get at the story inside. And now from the book, um, some sort of alchemy. Visiting my grandma, a rattler came, red bone heavy set, smile big, tawny, hipsy. She lived nowhere near to home, somewhere she living, away from a plump firstborn, in and out of Liesville, Wadesboro, PD. No one can quite remember how close it had been to Reverend Joshua's church. Still a rattler visit, a rattler golden, a rattler a textile maker with mimic on upholstery in factories near Bronx River. To visit her for some days when it's sunny, on a day like this the rattler sing to grandma. It sing to grandma is looking for it somewhere. Grandma dreamt of it singing, even when she working, the field she hear it singing. My grandma's husband is a jealous man, someone says, never let her go nowhere. Closer he wants her farther from Reverend Joshua. She give him her and no one else. She give him blue robin egg, her blue head rag, her blue watch from the fields on out in backwoods, the pines tall, the dry sandy earth. Her man waits, so does Rattler. The singing Rattler keeps between days, sometimes in the blackish blues of evenings, sings for only her, grandma never finds it. Closeness is a curious thing. No one ever mentions anyone being lovely or how far she was from kin or how close was she to Reverend Joshua by blood or by road for the sheriff close enough for the car to park along a road beside a church uncomfortable moments for a Sunday preacher suppose so for sheriff 1945 my mommy says 1945 Pearl Harbor was 1941 my mommy says again Pearl Harbor 1945 or 1941, long ago, whatever year that was, 1941 or 1945, whatever season that was, 1945 or 1941. Pearl Harbor, the kamikazes aim and die, the stilled house, blood spills and salt and soil and sand. Apart, grandma's man wants her, felt she lying through her teeth. He some other farmhand should have known. 
he, that boy that drive in from Georgia selling corn liquor. My grandma like her drink. She trade some cooch for three bottles. Yes, she did, or did she? He give my grandma blue lips. He gives her an indie. He kills her. Reverend Joshua bought her a ring shout. Your dead daughter hair. Hmm, what you gonna say? Hmm, that afternoon. Hmm, next week at service, she heard it singing. Hmm, singing loud it was, crying. Hmm, the garden she went into under their pot it was. Hmm, Scarlet Tanager, what you say? Big br brilliant rattler with seven rattles for seven years. Seven rattles rattling for seven directions. Hmm, my brothers and sisters know not the devil it was, but an angel mistaken for not the devil it was. Hmm, it was warning her, waiting it was. Hmm, waiting it was. Hmm, waiting. Um, Dilugo is chalagi for rice. Sakui sikwa, one hog, corner tub, fat back, kakalak, pelated woodpeckers, da la la. She drives into town, you log, ceiling, beams, exposed, drives you. Hawiya ukant yasan, bacon, corner tub, Miss Charlene, the name. Cook a mean rice and beans, sugar beans, turrets, but rice and peas the way you like. Back in Kakalaki, here rice fields no more. To keep company, someone from the West Indies, a big black mutt, a hound breeding in Tupelo, a wobbler wrapped around porch, all new China, Canadian geese come here all the time. The river, the swamp bordered by Yadkin, Jordan, wall to wall, hardwood floors. This mutt gonna keep the cotton mouse from your chickens, a ramp for you, for you, for you, a scooter. Um, and then this last poem. To clean you, Pada, to wash hair, to untangle, frontier feet, rub your feet, para, to oil, to anoint, to curse you, to exercise arms, to yank at your hair, to pinch your leg, to lotion your palms, to wash you, to stroke head, to stain you, to shame you, to feed, feed your green and mayor lemon parakeets. Talk to them, sing to them, hold my tongue, let the sister bitch, let the nephew bitch, let niece blame me, the bitch blame anyone, watch do nothing, let blind winos foddling, pelagic fantasies, fantasias, claim the liquor, keep my ebo, touch you everywhere, to abandon you, baby, you blame you, sleep, you little victim, quit my job and sustain mi lingua, hold my tongue, caution by elders, just be a good daughter, para and told and taught the good girl chores, Bye, 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 panties. Blanche, brand new bra from Lady Love. Gloves, usher, ivory. Why split your food stamps with someone who calls me a bitch on the regular? Buy you socks, bought you a bed. Your food, rice and beans, camarón, sweet plantains, California rolls. Beg you to eat, beg you to apologize. I listen to your eyes, grasp to your finality, curse, hear the fading, flee, absent for one day, been weeks holding my tongue, always lying to you. And if I can find this very, very quickly, because the, the, okay, I'm gonna open that up, so. Having this moment with the Zoom, not doing what I want to do. Yes, Lord. Okay. And we will close it with this.
Thank you. <laughs> oh, wow. What a finale. <laughs> that was spectacular, really. <laughs> Incredible. Thank you all so, so much for today. It's been a complete joy and um, it's just so, you're all so brilliant. Thank you, uh, Nicole, for putting everyone together. Thank you all for joining our Zoom today. Next Wednesday's reading will be put together by Sarah Riggs. Um, and tomorrow our NSC is the last installment of our uh, Women Life um, Freedom series, which is put together by Morish and Aliyuri. So join us for that. Um, there's a link in the chat to join our um, newsletter and you can donate to keep us, keep us free. Um, and thank you all again so much for joining. And here you can all now unmute. You should be able to unmute and say hello and goodbye as you leave. Thank you again so much for today. Yeah, I wanna say, I wanna say thank you to all you at, uh, at the Brooklyn Rail, but mm -hmm. Marcella, EJ, Latasha, Pierre, thank you so, so much. That was so much fun and um, I thank, you, oh, thank, no. you, thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Nicole. Nicole. Thank you all so much. Thank you. And okay. thank you all. Nicole. And thank you all for coming. For coming, there is a lot of people from far away. I mean, it's, it's yeah. nice to see people from close and far away. It's really heartwarming. Thank you so much. That was yes, thank you to all the birds of New York. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Our <laughs> thank you for letting us putting us in their poem letting us put them in poems <laughs> yeah they're gonna start asking for royalties soon <laughs> i think they were banging on my window earlier because i got some um house sparrows that come to my window because i put mm -hmm. out some feed some seeds for them so I think they were like, they were very aware of what we were doing. <laughs> yeah, they talk, they talk. Amazing, thank you all. Have wonderful rest of your days. Take care. Thank you to all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Natasha. Thank you, Michelle. So great to hear you guys yeah. breathe. <laughs>